just like you always do. Today is May 8th, 2020. 75 years ago, just after midnight French time, German leaders surrendered unconditionally to America, Britain, and our allies, ending World War II in Europe. Today, we honor and commemorate all those who died and all those who served in uniform and civilians at home to protect our way of life. When the Japanese surprise attacked at Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, the United States was not prepared for war but under the leadership of President Roosevelt, ramped up fast and seemingly overnight created America's gigantic war-making capability. Those three and a half years saw America at its very best. Men, women, and children working together day and night, regardless of skin color or ethnicity, regardless of political stripes or religious choice. Replacing men who had gone to war, millions of women invaded factories and made ships and planes tanks and trucks, guns and grenades, bombs and bullets. School children knitted wool squares to make blankets for our wounded soldiers. Penicillin was introduced. Americans of all ages embraced rationing of food and everything else needed for the troops on the front lines and tended victory gardens. Americans working together. America at its very best. Today, we remember and honor all those who died and all who served to preserve our very special and privileged way of life. It was a typically beautiful Honolulu morning, Sunday, December 7, 1941. Some were on their way to church, others sleeping off Saturday night fun, while the military and civilians enjoyed their quiet, uh, comfortable, complacent dawn. Six Japanese aircraft carriers were steaming to within flying range of Pearl Harbor and Ford Field. At exactly 7.48 a.m., the first of 353 Japanese planes started dropping bombs on the bulk of our country's Pacific fleet, which was mostly lined up, tied up, still in the water, in the tiny harbor, sitting ducks. Nine minutes later, at 7.57 that awful morning, a radio message crackled across the island, quote, air raid, Pearl Harbor, This is not a drill. In the stunning two-hour surprise attack by Japanese aircraft and submarines, 18 ships were sunk or damaged, 
Most of nearly 300 Navy, Marine, and Air Corps planes were decimated where they sat on tarmacs. Only a handful of American military aircraft got off the ground. 29 Japanese planes were shot down that morning. More than 2,400 of our Marines, sailors, soldiers, and civilians died. Nearly 1,200 were wounded. The world would never be the same. In a speech to Congress and the country the next day, President Roosevelt, declaring war on Japan, referred to the previous day of the attack, quote, a date that will live in infamy. A state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Admiral Yamamoto, the Japanese fleet commander, who masterminded the attack, said, quote, I fear all we have done today is to awaken a great sleeping giant and fill him with terrible resolve, unquote. Little did he know. Just four months after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Dick Cole was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot in the first Army Air Force B-25 light bomber to launch from the aircraft carrier Hornet. The 16 airplanes streamed to the Japanese homeland and successfully bombed Tokyo targets. Cole survived bailing out of their stricken aircraft over China and went on to fly the treacherous Himalaya Mountains, supplying our Chinese allies battling the Japanese in China. Soon after that, he was part of the very first air commando units of our air forces. After his long and highly decorated Air Force career, Lieutenant Colonel Dick Cole passed away recently at age 103. He was the last surviving member of the Doolittle Raiders. Dick, um, start us off, would you? There you were in the right seat of the B-25, yeah. the lead airplane to leave yeah. the aircraft carrier, April 18, 1942, <laughs> and in the left seat, Lieutenant Colonel and Lieutenant Colonel, um, Jimmy Doolittle. Um, what kind of a man was he, and how well did you know him at that point, Dick? Well, they was, uh, uh, back in 1990, uh, I had written some uh, little notes uh, concerning my thoughts about Colonel Doolittle. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, no. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you go. He's <laughs> <laughs> always ahead of you, all the time. Uh, actually, Colonel Doodle was five foot six, but uh, the way I, I was able to put it together was he was short in stature but tall, unaccomplishment. A man of integrity, honor, and courage. He excluded confidence, determination, and strength. He was intelligent, educated, and humble. Great respect for others. Led by example and inspiration to all, and we would have followed him anyway. I, for one, 
want to make sure that I arrived at the airplane before Colonel Doolittle. Well, he, I was the second lieutenant, and he was the lieutenant colonel, and I didn't want to uh, get uh, verbally lambasted for being late. I want you to know that uh, uh, the Raiders really appreciate your loyalty over the years. And uh, uh, their word, again, thank you uh, for uh, being here today and having fun. Adolf Hitler, the Fuhrer, dictator of Nazi Germany, along with Mao and Stalin, one of the most evil killer leaders of the 20th century. The Treaty of Versailles ended World War I. The treaty stripped defeated Germany of territory, of weapons, and what was left of its economy. Hitler was provoked to write his book, Mein Kampf, in English, My Struggle, where he laid out his plan for a new world order. His Nazi party would restore Germany and take over Europe. You know, I was a young guy also in those days, but I think their aim was how to, by political measures, you know, get an improvement of the whole situation means primarily economically, politically. And no member of any other party was idolized like Hitler in his party. He was a great leader, you know, in nothing, no word against him, no critique against him. What he said, this was right. Know that. In 1933, he anointed himself Führer, leader, and dictator. Hitler demanded loyalty from every German, not loyalty to their country, but to him, personally, by name. First thing uh, that was implemented by Hitler after he had taken to power was a ministry of propaganda. And under this ministry, all of the information industry had been centralized within half a year. That is, there, were, there was only one radio channel that was completely controlled by the Nazis and all of the print industry, all newspapers, all magazines were under control of a censor that sat in the Ministry of Propaganda. Uh, it was strictly forbidden by law uh, to listen to foreign radio stations, to, to radio stations outside Germany. Uh, so the first thing they tried was to limit the Germans' view on the outside world and make them think in the direction the Nazi party had decided the people should think to. Uh, Hitler managed to reduce unemployment uh, within two years to less than one million. So he was cheered upon like, like uh, as if he had magical powers. And most of the people thought, ah, well, this Jewish thing is really disgusting, uh, but basically, he seems to be the right man at the right place. In fiery speeches, day and night, to thousands, he preached two great evils, Judaism and communism. Over six years, Hitler built an overwhelmingly powerful and tactically brilliant military force, ground, sea, 
and air. He took over Austria and Czechoslovakia, then in 1939 invaded Poland. Within three months, he crushed six countries, controlled most of Western Europe, and was knocking on France's door. It was the most widespread war in history. It's estimated that at least 75 million people died. By 1944, more than two and a half million men and women were serving in the Army Air Corps. Over the course of the war, some 40,000 American airmen died. 18,000 went missing. 41,000 were captured. These numbers seem incomprehensible today. We and our allies in combat and at home paid huge personal prices to save the free world from oppression. Clarence E. Bud Anderson is a retired United States Air Force Colonel and World War II fighter pilot. At age 98, he is our country's ranking living fighter ace with 16 and a quarter air victories flying the P-51 Mustang over Germany and Europe. After the war, he spent most of his 30-year Air Force career as a test pilot. His last assignment was as wing commander of a tactical fighter wing in Vietnam. He is highly decorated and an inductee of the National Aviation Hall of Fame. Colonel, why is it important for us to commemorate VE Day 75 years later? World War II was a big deal. They um, had these two dictators in uh, Europe that uh, decided they're going to conquer Europe and uh, enslave the people, put them to work. So it was a grave, grave situation. And I think most, most Americans knew that. But um, once Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor, the country had a transformation, as I recall. And uh, saying, oh my goodness, uh, this really is serious. The country got behind the government, and, uh, but the tremendous manufacturing capability was uh, mobilized and, uh, and everybody was working towards winning the war. And our, our country became very patriotic. Everybody wanted to know what was going on in the war. Everybody had somebody in the service. And I think, well, you know, they called it the greatest generation, but uh, we were all just doing what really what we knew we had to do. The whole thing of World War II uh, needs to be remembered. It was, it was um, just a different time, and I don't think we'll see it again. If there is such a thing as a regular mission, uh, please describe one. How many aircraft, what types, and what were the missions? I would say there is no typical mission. It would be like like uh, playing cards. You know, you get a you get a hand, and you got to deal with it the way you know what's what's in your hand. But but in general, I could tell you most of our our missions uh, were escorting the uh, uh, B-17s and B-24s over Germany. We were transferred to the 8th Air Force, let's say uh, a, a mission to Berlin, perhaps. Uh, we, had a, we had a B-17 group very close to us, and we could hear them taking off while we're still in bed. So we'd go to the, the, the big briefing and then we'd find out where we're going. Then you started the engine up on start engine time and you taxied out 
and then you look for your flight to uh, come by. Then you taxied out and got in position. Here we are now. We're taxiing out 16 airplanes and probably had two spares behind that. And then uh, the leader would set course. We'd fly a kind of line of rest on a straight course towards our rendezvous with the bombers. Say mid mid uh, summer of '44, you could have 800 to a thousand bombers, and they'd be in a long stream. You know, just uh, once you, once you joined it, it was as far as the eye could see. And especially if they were pulling contrails, it was a very impressive uh, uh, sight. And then we'd pull up at the uh, rendezvous point, and then remember the uh, B-17s, B-24s on their tail. They had these big emblems, a square D or a triangle J, big letters up on the vertical uh, stabilizers. Then we would uh, set up uh, a zigzag course across the top of them to keep our speed up. We were generally flying, uh, well, of course, well above 25,000 feet. The bombers were be between 20 and 25. And we'd, uh, sometimes you'd be up at 30, 36, 37, trying to get on top of the overcast. And it's uh, minus, minus 50 up there. The B-51 did not have a good uh, heater, it had a little, little dinky tube that was over your uh, right leg up on, near the bottom of the instrument panel. And it had the words heat on it, but uh, it, I, uh, I, the only way I conquered it, I finally found uh, we got some issue bomber boots. I could stay pretty warm. We had uh, people like to know in that time, you know, what, what do you do if you, have to go, <laughs> and we did have a relief tube on it, but uh, I never used it because of such a high altitude. Sometimes that thing would, uh, you it was uh, down under your seat, you could bring it out and it was a tube, but it would ice up and uh, you'd end up with a, <laughs> we were young, we had pretty good bladders, so uh, if you didn't drink a lot of coffee beforehand, I, I could make it. And depending on what time after January of 44, we pretty much had uh, free range. Uh, Doolittle had, uh, had turned us loose, so let us, uh, let us follow the enemy down to the ground. Jimmy Doolittle is known for that daring B-25 1942 air raid on Tokyo. But how profound an effect did he also have on the air war over Germany a couple of years later? General Doolittle was one of my personal heroes. When we first got over there, uh, the 8th Air Force in November of 43, the 8th Air Force was in, in trouble with the bombing they thought that they could go over there in these large formations by themselves. They didn't even need fighter escort. Remember, we call them the, the uh, flying fortress, fight its way in, fight its way out. Well, they forgot to tell the Luftwaffe about it and uh, they were taking a tremendous toll. And they finally uh, had to have a bombing halt in uh, late 43. So they told us how to escort. They wanted us to stay close to the bombers. They wanted us to fly over the top, around them. They wanted to see you. They wanted us close. 
that as it turned out that wasn't the best way to do it they said when the enemy attacks the b-17s we want you to drive them away and come back we actually had an altitude limit we could go to uh, we could follow the enemy to 18,000 feet and if we hadn't shot them down we had to break it off come back up and escort so that's what we were doing up through the time until Jimmy Doolittle took over. So when he arrived, he went down to the 8th Air Force headquarters and uh, walked in there and he saw this big sign over the uh, door that the mission of the 8th Fighter Command is to bring the bombers home safely, something like that. He said, who put that up there? And General Kepner said, I don't know. It was here when I got here. He said, well, tear it down. The mission of the 8th Fighter Command is to destroy the Luftwaffe. And he said, from now on, you fighter pilots, we want you to, when they, you engage the enemy, follow them, take them to the ground and kill them. Uh, so, but we could also turn uh, a squadron, perhaps, uh, let them go out and freelance and see if they could find these huge formations of uh, Germans that were concentrating, uh, jo uh, joining up in uh, maybe 100, 200 airplanes and try to overwhelm the escort in one spot. The spring of 1944, I think most historians agree that that's when we broke the back of the Luftwaffe. Where did fear ever figure into the equation of your flying all those missions over Europe? Well, yeah, let's talk about uh, fear. Um, naturally, uh, there's some fear. Um, there's a war going on and, uh, you, you know, you might get killed. And so that, that gets your attention right away. Most of the fear would be... Uh, just flying over enemy territory uh, would uh, create some emotion because you knew if you went down there, uh, we'd been bombing those folks and they weren't too happy with us. We'd known of some instances where the Germans uh, had murdered uh, air crews. We didn't want to bail out, that's for sure. <laughs> if you got into an engagement, say single you know one versus one turning and turning and turning and trying to get on each other's tail at that point i really wasn't afraid it's amazing i think it was a survival thing and the adrenaline you're you're trying to you're, you know you're trying to well you get to kill or be killed and uh, that's pretty motivating you lost many fellow pilots in combat. Personally, how did and how do you deal with that? The loss, the loss of um, squadron mates is uh, the big memories that I have. I have them today. We had 28 pilots in our original uh, uh, fighter squadron that deployed overseas together. 50% of them were either killed or were prisoners of war. And uh, I personally lost uh, two, of my, uh, two of my good friends that I thought really a lot of, Jim Browning and uh, Eddie Simpson. And I thought so much of them that I actually named my son James Edward Anderson after him. Simpson, and, uh, and after I left in, on, uh, on my first tour, flew a bombing mission, landed in Russia, flew a bombing mission, landed in Italy. And a new guy ran into him and they collided and had to bail out over France. Or, which was still occupied by Germany and uh, joined up with the Free French. 
and and they went with them into a remote forest location to have a ceremony to um, honor their free French guys that were killed in combat. And the Germans got uh, word about this and sent an armed column out there to capture them. While they were leaving the camp as fast as they could, or the, or this, and uh, Eddie Simpson was in one of the last trucks that went out. And they could see that the Germans were coming too close. And so they jumped, a Frenchman jumped out of the truck and with a machine gun, and Eddie jumped out with him and helped him. And they blew up the first car and blocked the road, just like a movie. But uh, of course the Germans overwhelmed them and they were both shot. Uh, Jim Browning on the other hand, volunteered for a second tour and didn't even go home. And it was near the end of the war, tragically, that uh, he and Don Baquet were engaged in an aerial dogfight with uh, two ME-262s. And Browning and the 262 uh, were making head-on passes, playing chicken, and nobody chickened. And they collided, and uh, both of them were vaporized in uh, the, the, cra the crash. And, uh, How proud were your maintenance crews of their work on your airplanes? Well, our, our ground crews were, well, and my ground crew in particular were fantastic. I flew that 116 missions, which is 480 hours and 20 minutes, I think, without a single abort, mechanical abort, or, or any kind of an abort for the whole time which is an incredible record. And it's all due to my crew chiefs. And Otto Heino was my crew chief. And later I picked up my armor, Leon Zimmerman, Corporal Zimmerman. They weren't doing the dying, but they were doing the, the work too. So uh, I can't say enough about the crew chiefs of the world. Uh, we couldn't do without them and I had the best of the best. They kept me alive. Bob Hope was a megastar of vaudeville, movies, a TV, and radio for generations. Beginning in the early 1940s, around the start of World War II and throughout the war, Bob Hope performed his regular uh, weekly radio programs 144 times, nearly all of them on location as near to combat front lines as possible. He boosted morale where it was needed most among our young men and women fighting for our freedoms. Thank you. How do you do, fellas? This is Bob. This is Bob Command Performance Hope telling each Nazi that's in Russia today that Crimea doesn't pay. <laughs> Hope's eldest daughter, Linda Hope, is an author, award-winning TV producer, and chair and CEO of the Bob and Dolores Hope Foundation. Linda, why is it important for all of us to commemorate this 75th anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe? I think the important thing is really to remember earlier days, the days of World War II, and to acknowledge their, their heroism 
and the sacrifice. And I think it makes it even more relatable today because all of us are going through a period of some kind of sacrifice for a better good. And I think it's something that we can all relate to. Where did the idea come from for your dad to do these programs on location, uh, often at frontline military bases? Actually, it all happened sort of uh, by chance. Uh, one of dad's writers uh, had a brother who was serving at March Airfield. He said, you know, he told his brother that they were star for entertainment, and why didn't he bring the Bob Hope show down there? And uh, he did, and the rest is history, because the audience was just so receptive and so star for entertainment. And in those days, the entertainment picture was a lot different than it is today. And they really appreciated having somebody who was a star at that time uh, come out and, and uh, make them laugh. Describe your dad's radio programs in front of thousands of troops. Well, actually, I wasn't there for them, so it's very hard to, for me to say with any real authenticity. However, I've seen enough photos and heard enough of those broadcasts to know that they were certainly very well received. The first show that Dad did away was at March Field in 1941. What were the reactions from the troops? Uh, the reactions of the troops were just phenomenal. Uh, uh, to see their radio stars there in front of, in front of them uh, performing was just very uplifting and very meaningful to them. I mentioned the Bob and Dolores Hope Foundation that you chair. What is your mission? When Dad died, or before Dad died, he committed to leaving really everything that he gained through the generosity of the American audiences. Uh, he left that all back to the American public. He gave all of his books and papers to the Library of Congress to be used for the benefit of the American people. He left all the proceeds of the sale of his estate to his foundation, and the mandate for the foundation is to really continue his work with the troops. And so that's what we're doing, and to help those in need. How fulfilling do you think those experiences were for your dad, and how committed was he to our troops? I think those experiences that dad had during World War II with the troops was really mind-altering and, and changing, life-changing. He came to really realize that it was an important part of his life and something that he was really made to do. He was given the talent and he felt a, a commitment using that talent in the best possible way. Uh, Dad certainly was and continued uh, to be committed to the troops and, and ended up performing for the USO, you know, well into his 80s, I guess. So that's been a part of his life and an important part. I think the fact that Dad was very successful in his career, but the thing that was most meaningful and most important to him really was the work he did with the troops. Thanks for the memory of sentimental verse, nothing in my purse, and chuckles when the preacher said, for better or for worse, how lovely it was. This is Bob Hope. Well, this is it. That day we've been waiting for, that day we've been praying for. This day means so many different things to so many different people. To the men who made this day possible, who wrote V.E. on the calendar in letters of blood, we know that it means the beginning of life again. It means a girl with gold or with midnight or the setting sun in her hair. It means children known only by snapshots. It means home. Thanks to their sacrifices, we still have homes. Thanks to their sacrifices, there's one place left where you can still walk down a street and find all the buildings still in one piece. That was their promise to humanity, to sacrifice, and the world knows how completely they've kept their promise. To their wives, mothers, all their relatives and friends, this day is a day of relief. It means the end of worry and of sleepless nights. 
We've been headed for this day, May 8, 1945, for three and a half years of war. Three and a half years is a long time. For many Americans, it'll be forever. A terrible menace to civilization has been erased. One big roadblock on the way to that final victory day of full rejoicing has been removed. Congratulations, men. Thanks for the memory of faults that you forgave. Rainbows on a wave. And stockings in the basin when a fellow needs a shave. Thank you so much. Japan's devastating surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, launched the United States into full-blown total war with Japan, Germany, and Italy. Our civilian economy was transformed from civilian to wartime production, it seemed, overnight. Tens of thousands of young men enlisted or were drafted into uniform to fight the war. This left millions of jobs unfilled, and women came to factories all across industry to make guns, planes, and every other conceivable product to win the war. Nearly 19 million women were in America's wartime workforce, three million of them for their first time away from home responsibilities. Norman Rockwell's Saturday Evening Post cover, featuring Rosie the Riveter, was plastered all over the country, honoring women in America's fight. And we needed pilots for combat, tens of thousands of them. All of those would be young men, so female pilots jumped in to fill that void in September 1942, two women's pilot organizations formed separately, the WFTD, Women's Flying Training Detachment, and the WAFs, Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron. Well, in August 1943, those two were merged to create the WASP organization, Women's Air Force Service Pilots. General Hap Arnold, Chief of the Air Corps, selected the great female aviator Jackie Cochran to head up the WASPs. 25,000 women applied, 1,074 were accepted, all of them had prior flying experience and pilot's licenses. WASPs flew over 60 million air miles in every type of military aircraft. Our country is in their debt and today we honor these great patriot aviators. Schutze, start us off here. You're the star here today. What's your first memory of being interested in flying airplanes as a kid? Boy, that's going back a long way. <laughs> well, you just told me you were really 39, so it's not that long ago. <laughs> well, you've got to turn that one around. <laughs> when I was seven, I said to my family, when I grow up, I'm going to learn how to fly. But I had the interest long before that. What was your parents' reaction to your telling them that you wanted to fly? You're crazy. Girls don't fly. Boy, so what did you do? I mean, obviously you figured it out along the way. How did you go about it? Well, I didn't really figure it out. I just knew I wanted to fly. I see an airplane go by. And when I was a youngster, an airplane going by one every 10 days. That was a big traffic pattern. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just... Studied. I, when I, after I learned how to read, I read everything I could on aviation. I even took my brother's Boy Scout magazine and read the articles on aviation there. I was really at gun ho So how did you get around your parents not wanting you to fly? I mean, you had to raise the money. You had to keep it from them. What did you do? Well, they were very supportive. If you had a oh. dream, they figured, try it. If you don't make it, at least you had a dream. 
Huh. Navy school is true life without a dream. So you went to night school, yes? Well, I went to night school, but that's only because it was the CPT program. I got out of uh, high school, they had a little article in the paper about their aeronautical classes. I signed up. And, but, when it was a test. They were going to pick five young women, as I understand it, to have scholarships to learn to fly, correct? Not, not women, men. When I, w when I reported for this ground school, I found out that there was a scholarship involved. Five scholarships, of which only one could be a woman. There was only two women in the class, so I figured I had it made. <laughs> but I also found out that the guys that were taking the course had taken it three or four times, so I figured they'd pass on perfect attendance. I took the private pilot's license at the end of the uh, course, and the five highest score would get the flight scholarship, and I was one of the five. And then what happened? They took it away from me. What did they say when they took it away from you? The war in Europe isn't going well. We need men. We don't, women don't fly, so we're going to give it to number six. So what did you do to get around that? I fought it to and nail. My argument was, you gave it, to me, it's mine. You're giving it away. You're stealing it. So I think I made such a fuss, they gave it back to me just to shut me up. World War II was underway when Connie Palacios was 18 and just out of high school. She took a job as a riveter at the Boeing Wichita Aircraft Factory. She was one of the original Rosie the Riveters. She is in her mid-90s now and just as sharp and snappy as she was when she was putting rivets in the very first B-29 to roll off the assembly line. And then they sent, they sent me to a school there in Wichita. And they had a, a school there. They sent me there because it, they needed riveters. The first day I was there, I didn't rivet. Kind of a little disappointing to me, but uh, the reason I didn't was that the last B-17 was being, uh, they were building in there, but they were going to finish it. And the next day they were going to start with the B-29. They asked me to uh, to rivet, but they, they said, well, we, we don't have any buckers. We only have one person, but they, nobody wanted to work with her because she's a black girl. And because in those days they were very prejudiced. Huh? Well, I said, I don't mind working with her because I'm a minority too, because I am a Mexican descent. So they said, are you sure? Yes, I'll work with her. So she became my partner and I'm telling you, she was the best bucker. And if it hadn't been for her, I couldn't have rivet like I did. And then, of course, the Japanese also had Tokyo Rose, and she was always on, uh, on the radio, and she was trying to break the morale of the boys. So that's why we started calling us Rosie the Riveter, because we were, well, it would make us so angry. And so all us women, we tried to work harder so we can get those planes out of there so we can get to Japan.
Well, it's a better life, I tell you, because we don't have the prejudice we used to have. And everybody is treated more equal, you know, and and it's a great place to to live, America, because I've been in foreign countries. I went to Venezuela to help build a church in 97. And I tell you, there's nothing like the United States. So I am very proud to be an American citizen that I was born in the United States. The great aviator, Jimmy Doolittle, said that Bob Hoover was the best stick and rudder pilot ever. Hoover was a World War II fighter pilot flying from North Africa over the Mediterranean and Sicily. He was shot down by the Luftwaffe and spent 16 months in Stalag I, a German prison camp in northern Germany. After several attempts to escape, he was finally successful he commandeered a German fighter plane and flew himself to safety in Holland. Later, as a test pilot, he flew chase on the Bell XS-1 rocket flight that broke the sound barrier for the first time in 1947 and did take that famous photo of the flight. He is an inductee of the National Aviation Hall of Fame. Adlai Stevenson once said, patriotism is not a short and frenzied outburst of emotion, but the tranquil and steady dedication of a lifetime. Well, measured by that yardstick, there is no greater patriot than Bob Hoover, for love of country has indeed been his steady dedication of a lifetime. I guess I've been called a patriotic freak. I think that uh, if we don't know the meaning of the national anthem and that flag that we've cherished so much with its full appreciation for what it stands for, we're missing the best bet in the whole world. It stands for freedom. It stands for everything we believe in. The American flag, as a symbol of personal liberty, became an obsession of Bob Hoover's during the dark days that he spent as a prisoner of the Nazis in World War II. And in Germany, it was like a country club because you didn't get mistreated or you didn't get beat up or knocked unconscious unless you tried to escape. And I'm one of the dummies that I thought myself, I'm a patriot, I'm never going to give in to anybody, I'm fighting for our freedom. And when I couldn't see that flag, it, it, it made me angry, and it made me want to get out of that place any way I could, or make it as miserable for them to contain me as it could possibly be. And I'll admit, I, I was beaten up. And, dragged out unconscious. Uh, some fellow wrote a letter to the VA after the war and he said, I watched him beat him to unconsciousness and drag him out and I wondered if he ever survived the war. Well, obviously I did. Well, Bob Hoover eventually escaped from Stalag Luft I. Incredibly, he made his way to a German airfield, stole a German airplane, and flew himself to the Netherlands, which had already been liberated by the Allies. 
After the war, he was assigned to flight test at Wright-Patterson in Dayton, Ohio, and became a member of an elite cadre of pilots developing a whole new age in aviation, the jet age. Gunter Rohl was a German fighter pilot and the third-ranking Luftwaffe ace. After the war, Rohl became a leader of West Germany's new Air Force and became friends with many American pilots. A fighter pilot has a personal relation to his enemy. He sees him. It's man to man. Where we had the real dogfights in Russia, because you could see his face. So we, we, we respected each other. He fought for his country, I fought for his country, and we had personal contact in the air. So you have a personal relationship, and this is that the fighter pilots after the war became friends. It's typical. I'm a very emotional guy for a fighter pilot, I'll tell you. But I love this country, and every young person who lives here ought to be blessed to know that they've been so fortunate to be born here. And when the time becomes that you have to do your thing for your country, you better damn well step up to the bat and do it. See, you, anybody who's so fortunate, he feels the same about his country. Three wars and I'm still here. I'm 88. I feel fine. I'd go to tomorrow and fight, but I wouldn't fight against Gunther. I remember one evening after a hard day of work uh, when we were working on the biography and we sat right here on the por under the porch, uh, both of us with a glass of whiskey in our hands and didn't speak for a couple of minutes and suddenly into the silence he said, you know what, I looked into the faces of most of the guys I had to kill and tears ran down his face and I said, why so? And he said, you know, the Air war on the Eastern Front took place in altitudes below 5,000, 10,000 feet. Nobody wore an oxygen mask. And when you engaged, you came across the guy before you turned in. And I could see them, and a minute later they were dead. And that was something that surprised me really, because at first glance he's just a cool cut warrior, you know. But if you get to know him a bit better, uh, and not only him, uh, this might be true for most of the World War, or many of the World War II veterans. Uh, it really bothers them and will, them bo will bother them till they do their last breath. In 1936, the Douglas Aircraft Company rolled out the first DC-3, it was called, a civilian airliner that led the way in passenger air travel. And when World War II broke out in 1941, military leaders saw that a modified DC-3 could be very useful in combat. Little did they know. The C, C is for cargo, the C-47 became a workhorse, especially in World War II and later in Vietnam. It flew supplies and troops, uh, did search and rescue and medical evacuation. It dropped paratroopers and inserted special operations forces behind enemy lines. 
More than 10,000 American C-47s served in World War II, and thousands more variants were flown by American allies. The plane served in every theater during World War II. In July 1943, C-47s dropped 4,300 paratroopers on Sicily as part of Operation Husky to drive the Nazis from the island. In 1944, C-47s inserted special forces behind enemy lines for the very first time to clear Japanese from Burma. And June 6, 1944, was the day Allied forces invaded German-occupied France, D-Day. The night before, over 1,000 C-47s dropped 18,000 paratroopers into France in darkness. At dawn the next day, Allies stormed the Normandy beaches, 6,000 ships and landing craft, 11,000 aircraft, and over 150,000 soldiers, sailors, and Marines. It was the beginning of the end for Nazi Germany. Carnig Tomassian was from Brooklyn. He enlisted in the Army at age 18 and became a left gunner on the B-29. On his third combat mission over Burma, there was an explosion. He bailed out and spent six months as a prisoner of the Japanese. He was one of only a few survivors of that POW camp. He was liberated, recovered, and came home. He was discharged as a staff sergeant at the age of 22. So you're taken prisoner by the Japanese. Right. How were you treated? Well, Japanese were Japanese. It was a... What's that mean? It was a different philosophy of life with the Japanese at that period of time. They were the ones that were guarding us were of a different caliber. They must have been chosen to be cruel. I don't know what it is. I remember once I was dozing in my uh, solitary cell and uh, I was sleeping and Brooksy, my radio officer, said, Tommy, Tommy, get him. He guy's guard's coming. Well, I, I got up in the stupor and just stood there and he just came in and by. Now, what, what, what happens if you don't? What happens if you don't happen to me? He brought me out of the cell at another time. He put the gun to my forehead, and he clicked it, and it was empty. And he laughed with his gold tooth sticking out and shoved me back in the cell. Well, boy, I almost passed out. They had this fun, and on Friday nights, when they drink, they would come and beat up the guys for nothing. For nothing. Carnig, you were liberated, got better, hospitals, got in C-47, found your way back, on your way into LaGuardia. And you wrote that the pilot came across the harbor and where did he bank the airplane? So he said, look outside window of the plane. 
And so we all looked out, and he dropped down to about 500 feet, and he banked around the Statue of Liberty. I can't express what that did, what that meant. I was home. That was my home. It was just, oh, uh, it's, you know, there are moments like this you can't really, you never forget, number one. And the, uh, the other moment that I'll never forget is I went up to my apartment uh, where I lived and a spalding ball came down and I picked it up and I, this little kid comes up with his hat on the side and his big glove, oversized glove. Give me the ball, he says. I said, oh, all right. Give me the ball or I'll waltz one up your snot box. <laughs> I, I was home. <laughs> The United States military was segregated until many years after the end of World War II. There was as much racism in military leadership as in much of the country. When World War II began for our country at Pearl Harbor, young colored men by the thousands rushed to enlist to serve, but were told they could only do menial jobs, that they had, quote, smaller brains than whites had inferior mentality, lacked courage, and were unfit for combat, end quote. Nonsense, of course, as colored troops had served with honor and distinction in every war from the American Revolution through the Civil War and World War I. Retired Air Force Brigadier General Charles McGee broke records. As one of the first Tuskegee Airmen pilots, he flew 409 fighter missions in three wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. In his 32-year Air Force career, he commanded at many levels as he helped defeat racism in the United States Air Force. He is highly decorated and an inductee of the National Aviation Hall of Fame. So where did it come from in you and your colleagues to be able to say, I will not only join to defend the country, but I'm going to join and fight racism? What did it take inside you to do that? Well, I think uh, number one, and I think the first thing that we were all thankful that we had parents and grandparents that said, go to high school, go to college, let's get an education. And that was a requirement when uh, the war broke out to uh, have that education. So that was important. In my own kind of growing up, uh, I, I did learn, uh, I guess you might say from a religious point of view, you know, treat your neighbor as yourself, as you want to be treated. Uh, a little later, uh, in my years, I was glad to be a Boy Scout. And I still say that if we all live by that Scout Oath and those 12 Scout Laws, you know, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. reverent. If we all, yes indeed, folks. If, if everybody lived by those laws, we'd have a, quite a different country. But that was the type of thing that helped me. And we, I realized fighting doesn't solve an issue. You're bruised and, and, and you're still mad at each other. <laughs> so it takes a little different way of living. And, and uh, 
I think that's what sustained the majority of those that became a part of this first experiment because the Army said we studied and we know it isn't going to work. So that was the term. They called it the experiment. Exactly. They all, the experiment was authorizing the 99th Pursuit Squadron. Of course, the fine print to maintain segregation said all of the necessary support. So besides 32 pilots, that's a couple hundred technicians and mechanics and of course, you needed uh, medical and communication and also it's almost another couple hundred supply, another couple hundred people because they insisted on segregation and that 99th went into combat taking care of still segregated overseas but attached to white groups but not at the same base. Charles, you're incredible career in the Air Force. What is your experience growing up and, and in the Air Force told you about our country, about what our country is? Well, that, that's... How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, interesting, I told that... Uh, we can support the country regardless of our color or accident of birth. It's more about being prepared. It's about having an education, being willing to serve this country and enjoy the freedoms that we so much enjoy that creeping away in many little ways. Uh, but it's something that uh, we need to let our young folks know. I think even that's what this flyby is going to do. Remember, don't forget, but we don't need to repeat it. And this is the type of thing that I think out of lessons, our experience uh, allowed the uh, move away from the attitudes that existed earlier, saying something we couldn't do or denying an opportunity, but it lifted up the challenge of being prepared uh, that, uh, and this is a challenge to our young people to, today, there's so much going on, but it's the things they need to know to be a part of our country's future and continue to enjoy the freedoms, freedoms that, that we have. Arsenal of Democracy events scheduled for May 7 and May 8 have been postponed until late September. The evening of September 24th, eight World War II heroes will share their wartime experiences with the audience at a gala dinner. The following morning, more than 100 World War II type aircraft will do a giant flyover of the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, down the mall, over the World War II Memorial, the new Eisenhower Memorial, Smithsonian Air and Space, and the Capitol. The events will commemorate and honor those who died in World War II and all who served then and now in the military and the civilians who work at home to help protect our freedoms. For the Arsenal of Democracy, I'm David Hartman.
Welcome home and thank you.